Hello, this is Ray Bowman. In this lesson, we're going to go over an example of an international landed cost. In previous videos, uh, we've talked about sort of the concepts, sort of some of the, the main pr key pricing uh, components of an international landed cost. But in this lesson, we're going to go over an example in detail. And I'm going to go over really a whole list of a lot of the different things that can go into an international price between buyer, seller, and um, where applicable that seller's ultimate customer. And so this is really critical. A lot of international companies get pricing wrong. And part of the reason they get pricing wrong is there's so much to it, especially when you're going internationally. So what I have here is a tool uh, that I use with a lot of my uh, international clients to kind of help them uh, construct their price and see what it looks like. I also use this a lot in classes, and those of you who take my CGBP course uh, will actually use this as the basis for an assignment. So as you can see here on the screen, we have the direct costs. Now these direct costs really aren't that much different from a domestic sale. Um, they may include some international components like packaging for export. But as you can see here, um, here are some very common costs. I have uh, $20,000 here for materials. Um, in this model, in this spreadsheet model that I have, I put the unit amount up in this box. So in this case, I put 10,000 units. Um, then here on the direct costs, I put $20,000 in materials. Um, I put a sales commission uh, in this example of 5%. Now you may also have royalties um, that apply to your international transaction. Uh, so that's something you may have to account for. Um, product inspections. In international business, it's not unusual to have pre-export inspections and that's something that you definitely want to recover within your price if your buyer is requiring that. Uh, the seller's margin, uh, in this example I have a 35 percent uh, seller's margin. Uh, you may have certifications um, that I didn't put in this example. Uh, individual packaging, so now we get into the packaging of the product. Labor costs, so I put the labor costs at slightly over what the material costs are of $25,000. Um, you may have charges to put the packaged material in master cartons. So if you can imagine the retail packaging and then having the packaging um, in cartons. Um, so let's say that you, you're shipping you know, uh, packages of t-shirts. Uh, those might go into master cartons. Um, any miscellaneous charges, packaging for export, which gives you a final cost of $57,000. So what we would also call these direct costs are the X-Works price. So uh, the X-Works price is very similar to the domestic sales price. And again, the only thing that might be different is the packaging for export or any inspections related to export. Now, the difference in international trade quite often is all of these indirect costs. So you have all kinds of indirect costs related to freight, shipping, packaging, forklifts. So this is what really separates a, um, a domestic sale from an international sale in terms of complexity. And that's all these indirect costs. Now the example I'm going to give you here is going to have columns for both seller and buyer. Because again, in international business, we negotiate different ways according to what our incoterm is and what we've negotiated through the buyer and seller agreement. So any of these indirect costs may be covered either by the buyer or the seller. The reason I have both buyer and seller costs in here is that both those costs roll in to the ultimate landed cost to the consumer, so we need to consider these. So for this exercise, I've got um, 38 $3,850, that's uh, for ocean freight. And again, I have a column here for air freight. I have pre-carriage costs in here. So pre-carriage is basically the pickup from uh, the location, wherever the goods are, uh, to the port of exit. Uh, it's not unusual to have international documentation costs. I put $150 here. 
You may have freight forwarding fees that you want to account for. Uh, AES in the US, uh, we have AES filings. It's an electronic filing required by customs. Um, AES filings are used, one, to keep statistics on our export trade, but it's also used to track export licenses as well. So um, an AES transmittal is required for all exports, so um, that's something that uh, you have to account for. Whether you're uh, doing that AES filing yourself or your freight forwarder is, chances are there's some allocated cost to that. Export licensing, I didn't put anything here, but there's a lot of transactions where you may have a cost for your export licensing, and those costs are mostly indirect costs related to preparing uh, that export license. There's also, uh, if you're doing State Department licensing, like ITAR, so some, some items may be a military sale, uh, then there's registration costs as well that, that go into that. So you might account for that in the transaction or just roll that into the overhead costs of uh, doing business. Um, you may have loading and unloading charges um, that are required to make the export happen. A lot of consolidated shipments may require forklift fees, warehousing fees, inspection fees. If you see here, I have these yellow boxes. Now, what these yellow boxes both here and up above signify are the percentage costs that go into a landed international cost. Now, the reason I sort of highlight them and put them aside is we have to account for them in our price. We definitely want to account for them as to where they are in our price, in other words, direct, indirect, or administrative. But ultimately, those percentage costs have to be calculated at the end once we add up all of our uh, direct costs. Um, we may have cargo insurance. A lot of goods get inspected, uh, um, um, you know, get covered under cargo insurance, so we have to account for that. I put half a percent here. Uh, the rates can vary, um, and, and they're usually based on uh, amounts per every hundred dollars of value. So it's not unusual to pay about half a percent there. Um, import duty. In this case, I put the import duty as the responsibility of the buyer. Uh, I put 20% uh, duty on this item. Uh, some items may be 0% duty. Some items may uh, be 100% duty or have compound duties. So it depends on the product, and that's determined through the harmonized code, which we'll talk about in other lessons. But um, for this exercise, just remember that you have to account for duty rates. You may have value-added taxes, so this would go on to the landed cost of the item and usually covered by the buyer. Uh, you may have warehousing costs, uh, compound duties. In other words, there are some items that may have compound duties on them. These items are usually items that are subject to countervailing duties uh, or anti-dumping duties. In other words, if any particular country feels that those products are being dumped under market value, uh, they may charge an additional duty fee to compensate for, um, for the discrepancy in market value. Uh, you may have terminal charges, uh, customs brokerage fees on the import side. So in this example, I put these fees onto the side of the buyer. Uh, you may have customs inspection. Uh, in the Port of Los Angeles, the average customs inspection runs about $1,500 and about a five-day delay. So um, particularly if you're a new importer, you want to account for that in your price. Uh, merchandise processing fees. So in the U.S., there's a certain formula for merchandise processing and harbor maintenance fees. Uh, harbor maintenance fees applies um, to goods imported into the United States through a seaport. So you would account for those. And again, those are percentage costs. So now we have a total for those indirect fees. So as you can see in this example, we have $5,000 allocated on the cost of the seller. And then you have a uh, cost that the buyer is going to absorb on their side. Then we have general and administrative fees. So those fees might be uh, fees related to credit insurance. Uh, credit insurance is a way of protecting your international receivables. Um, so a lot of exporters use this as a way of mitigating their risk. 
Uh, you may have accounts receivable or payable uh, uh, expenses that you want to account for. Uh, sales and international marketing. Some companies um, may roll this into their product price or they may just roll it into the general expenses of their business. So it just depends on the company. You may have fees related to legal expenses or attorneys. Um, and again, you may roll this into the the transaction price or you may just realize it as an overall cost of doing business within your company. Uh, cost of capital. It's very important to understand and we talk about this in our videos that cover finance is to recover the cost that you have to pay as an exporter if you're um, if you're giving open account terms to your buyer. So if you're giving terms to your buyer you want to account for your rate your borrowing rate, so in this case it's 8% uh, per annum, and the amount of days that you're going to be waiting to get paid that amount. So in this example I have 45 days. So it's a very important international trade to be able to account for your cost of money and we've accounted for it in this example. So all of those costs, so if we look again at an international landed cost, we have these direct costs which are really uh, account for most of our domestic costs or what we call X works costs if you're using INCO terms. We have our indirect cost which is a lot of the costs related to transportation, uh, customs brokerage, pickup and delivery and again these are the items of costs that uh, that are, are often miss in, in, missed in an international price. Then we have our general and administrative costs um, which can be both our domestic costs that we have to account for as well as costs that may be different because we're doing an international transaction. Now all these percentages get accounted for at the end because we have to roll up those um, those fixed costs first or those flat rated costs and then work our percentage costs into there. So in this example that we have of 10,000 units we come up with a unit cost of $9.12 with a total cost of $91,000 um, Now remember there are costs that the buyer is going to bear so this cost represents what the seller is selling to the buyer. Now the buyer in this example is selling to their ultimate client so in this case let's say it's a retailer so now the buyer because they have additional costs um, that they bear that are separate from what they were quoted, their costs go up. So uh, in the example that I gave here, the buyer is absorbing costs mostly related to the import uh, clearance of the goods and we see it reflected here at $10.28 with a total transaction of $102,835. So if you look at here, look how that unit cost has gone up of that particular item um, as well as the total sale price and in international business you want to be very careful and very conscious of not only the um, the total sales price but how that affects your cost per unit because after all the ultimate consumer is concerned with that cost per unit as well as that uh, in this case retailer so now we look at what the retailer is then going to sell um, to their ultimate customer. So in this example, I've put a 50% margin on uh, for that retailer. That's um, a fairly standard markup for many, many retailers. So that alone brings up the cost and doubles it to um, $20.57 per that unit with a total uh, amount of um, of that inventory being sold of two hundred and five thousand. So it's kind of interesting to look at from the seller to the buyer to the ultimate um, retailer that then sells to the consumer. So if you can imagine a consumer buying an item, you or I going into a retailer and buying an item for twenty dollars and fifty seven cents. Well, that item started. Um, with the seller at nine dollars and twelve cents and again remember all of these add-on charges are added value 
they're either added value or added costs related to compliance um, and other types of items but they all add value to the cost right the ultimate consumer uh, is usually not going to go to that foreign country just to pick up that item. So the entire value chain uh, does what it says. It adds value. Now what's important in the landed cost to remember is is that quite often most exporters all they know in terms of pricing when they start out is what the item sells for in the foreign country. So what I've done is on this spreadsheet we have a way of reversing out the price. In other words, once we have a landed cost, once we've studied all these costs between the buyer and seller, all those costs we can use to benchmark a price. So in here, in this spreadsheet, this column, this last column, has basically taken the ultimate cost of the retailer to the consumer and broke that down into percentages. Well, we can use these percentages to benchmark cost. So what we've done here uh, is put a benchmark unit cost and a benchmark total unit. So in this case, even though we have a $20.57 cost, our target price in the foreign country we've put at $19.99. So very slight difference between the prices, but if you're talking being competitive in international markets, sometimes that's all it takes is less than a dollar. A few cents can make the difference between making the sale and not making the sale. So in this example when we plug in these numbers we use these percentages to reverse and see where we are in terms of pricing. In other words if we want to meet the competitive cost where do we have to be? So here in the in the cost of um, cost of goods alone uh, we have a discrepancy here of a few hundred dollars. Well, do we want to take uh, less profit um, and and try to be competitive there, or do we look at the uh, uh, the freight costs and see what the difference is there? So here we see in the freight costs we have a um, little over a hundred dollars worth of savings. Well, maybe that's a savings that we can make in order to bring this cost more in line and be more competitive. So it's really important to look at both the costs of the seller, the costs of the buyer, who the ultimate buyer of those goods are, whether it's uh, the retailer selling to the ultimate consumer or if it's going direct to the consumer. We need to know what that target price is. And the best way to work out our pricing and see where we're at is not only research and study those cost components, but then work backwards from the ultimate consumer price. Now the other thing we have to be conscious of, because this relates to our selling agreements and the responsibilities between buyer and seller, is to look at our INCO terms. So in this chart, this is actually an interactive chart, so this example that I just showed you demonstrates a CIF price, which means cost, insurance, and freight. This price could also constitute, if we were using another mode of transportation, or we could use this for ocean is CPT which is carriage paid to. So uh, the costs are very similar here. So let's see what happens when we take the freight costs, take that out, and put the 3850 onto the buyer. It changes our income term. We're now looking at an INCO term of FOB because now the buyer is covering those costs. So it's important to look at these landed costs not only from an aspect of realizing all of the components that have to go into that price, but also really realizing how that affects the INCO term and how we negotiate our sales. So I hope this, uh, this overview has been useful for you in understanding all the things that go into costs. And again, if I can put any message forward, is landed cost is really something you have to do your homework on. Uh, it can be very simple or it can be fairly complex, but you want to make sure that you realize all the items of cost that go in um, so you have a good accurate price. Without a good accurate price, your financials are off, your forecasts are off, and uh, you can be impeding your ability to sell 
or to recover profits that you should because you haven't calculated the price correctly. So I hope this was useful for you and uh, talk to you next time.